Hello. Thank you for visiting the Truth About Cheating channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Last summer, this incredible story happened in my life. It all started when I accidentally discovered my wife's infidelity, literally catching her red-handed during her affair. I had never felt such offense and thirst for revenge in my life. I didn't even suspect that my hatred could lead to consequences of such enormous scale. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is John, I'm 28 years old. They say I look younger than my age, a slender brunette with brown eyes. After college, I got a job as a financial analyst at a company, and I'm probably an example of someone who really loves their work. My wife Ellie was 27. She was a slender brunette with long legs, a beautiful face, and green eyes. It's hard not to notice such a beauty. She worked as a manager and was quite the workaholic. At least that's what I used to think before. I met Ellie in our freshman year of college. We immediately liked each other, and after a few weeks of talking, we started dating. We spent a lot of time together, got to know each other better. I realized Ellie was the one I wanted to spend my life with. A year after we graduated from college, I proposed and she agreed to become my wife. It's been five years since then. I used to think that the more love and attention you show a woman, the more she appreciates your presence in her life. Now I understand that's not entirely true. Such behavior only makes a woman take you and everything you do for granted. I came to this conclusion based on my experience with Ellie. Over time, my wife clearly grew cold towards me failing to notice my efforts. For example, when we went on dates, she dressed quite simply, without any desire to look good. Even for work, she wore more revealing outfits and carefully put on makeup, as if getting ready for something. My love and care didn't seem to play any role for Ellie, otherwise she wouldn't have spent her time in the company of other men. I accidentally discovered Ellie's infidelity at the company Christmas party, which took place in a hotel in town. Her company rented a large hall and several hotel rooms for employees. The party was scheduled for Wednesday and I arranged to meet Ellie there. The party start time was 6 p.m., but I had a meeting with a client before that. So I warned Ellie that I wouldn't arrive before 7. At the last moment, the client changed plans and canceled our meeting, so I was able to arrive at the hotel around 6.30. When I entered the hall, I saw Ellie hugging a man I didn't know. The hug didn't look just friendly and it raised my suspicions. They went down one of the corridors. I followed them there and discovered a kind of lobby with three rooms. I became curious which one they entered. I peeked into the first room. It was empty. Same with the second. When I was about to exit, I heard giggling. It seemed to come from inside the room, but there was no one there. I listened closely. Another chuckle came from the ventilation hole in the ceiling. That's when I figured all the sounds were coming from the adjacent room. Hey, you'll tear my dress! Ellie protested, but there was more playfulness in her tone. I heard the rustling of clothes. I want to touch you! A masculine voice answered longingly. Be patient until tomorrow, baby. My husband will be here in half an hour. He might get suspicious if I look inappropriate. I need you now. I don't want to risk it, baby, but I can ease your tension. I heard more rustling of clothes, the jingle of a belt buckle, and soon the man blissfully moaned. Ellie, you're gorgeous. Your lips are so soft. You're simply magical. The moans continued for a minute or two until they peaked. Hey, Oliver will be very mad we didn't invite him as a third. No worries, we have tomorrow night for that. Get dressed, we need to return to the party. It's incredible how quickly love can fade away. In mere seconds, I went through a whole spectrum of emotions, from boundless affection to absolute hatred. A real battle was happening inside me. On one hand, I was ready to kick down that door and beat them both. On the other, I wanted to use what I heard to plan my revenge for her betrayal. I was torn between the urges to lash out immediately while passions ran high and to wait in order to find out more details, names of other men, dates, meeting locations. If I barge it now, I could be accused of assault, especially in such a public place. I needed more intel. 
I hurried out of the hotel and into my car before it was time to meet with Ellie. When I returned to the ballroom, I saw her at one of the tables with two other couples and that same man who had hugged her earlier. Even from a distance, it was clear he was a very attractive muscular brunette in his thirties. Ellie noticed me approaching their table. She stood up, spread her arms for a hug, and leaned in to kiss me with those depraved lips that just kissed another man moments ago. But at the last moment, I turned my head so the kiss landed on my cheek. I noticed the surprise on her face that for the first time I dodged her greeting. Inside me, everything was boiling with fury and resentment, but I tried keeping myself in check. I seemed to be coming down with something, honey. I don't want you to catch it. I lied. Ellie introduced me to the others at the table. The hunk's name was Oscar. When he stood to shake my hand, I sized up his build and height. It was important to gauge his reach in case things turned violent. We sat down and struck up small talk with my wife's colleagues. I felt that both couples seemed a little tense as if expecting some kind of outburst from me. There was an involuntary sense that they knew about Ellie's affairs and were just observing whether I myself was aware. During the evening, I danced with Ellie twice. On the second one, she whispered in my ear how terribly she missed me and wanted us to be alone at home. I nearly laughed at her audacity to invite me home after what I had uncovered. But I continued playing the role of a trusting husband. In the car, she acted as if nothing had happened, chatted cheerfully about work and colleagues. At home, Ellie immediately threw her arms around my neck and started kissing. But I gently pushed her away, citing a headache. Sorry, honey, but I feel really awful. My head is splitting from all that noise and flashing lights at the party. I went into the bedroom, sat on the bed and held my head in my hands as if in agony. Oh, I can't. I'm not thinking straight. Let's just go to sleep instead. Ellie was disappointed, but what could she say? She changed into pajamas and got into bed, grumbling something about my insufferable migraines. I pretended to fall asleep, although I didn't close an eye all night, replaying the hotel scenes in my mind. The next morning, I woke up before Ellie and sat in the kitchen with a cup of coffee, putting on a pained expression. Good morning. How are you feeling? She asked, entering the room. I made my voice faint. Awful, barely slept because of this damned migraine. The doctor's office doesn't open until 10 a.m. I think it's best if I call work and let them know I won't be coming in today. I reached for the phone as Ellie poured herself coffee and got ready. Don't forget, I'll be working late tonight, she said. We're still going over that damned budget until Tuesday. Of course, dear. I replied, not calling work after all. I had something more interesting planned after her late night. As soon as Ellie left for work, I got changed and called my secretary to let her know I have a doctor's appointment and won't be at the office for the rest of the day. After that, I went to the public library and used their computers to look up Ellie's company information. I found out the names, addresses and phone numbers of all the top managers as well as board members. After studying the biographies of the directors and chairmen, I tried figuring out how they might react to a scandal. And I liked what I discovered. Even a hint of a sex scandal would get Ellie and her two lovers fired without further questions. I smiled to myself, anticipating the payback for her betrayal. All I had left was to pick the right moment to ruin Ellie's reputation along with that of her gentleman callers. That same evening, I parked near Ellie's office building and waited for her to leave work. When Ellie finally emerged from the office and got into her car, I tailed her across town. She turned into a roadside motel parking lot and knocked on a certain door. It was opened by that same man I caught her with, letting her inside. A few minutes later, another man pulled up, got out of his car and went straight to the same room. That must have been Oliver. I could only guess what was happening inside, but I doubted they were discussing work matters. I became curious how Ellie's company leadership might react to the fact that their employees were spending their free time together at a motel. It could have interesting consequences. I wrote down the details about Oliver's and Oscar's cars and drove home, pondering what I had found out online. 
Both Oscar and Oliver were married. From what I gathered, neither wife was at the company party with their husbands. I needed to find out more about them, maybe even get them on my side. Together we could make Ellie's, Oscar's and Oliver's lives a living hell. I'd also recalled something I hadn't paid attention to before. Ellie would always work late on Mondays and Thursdays. She explained it away with work matters and I'd never doubted her. Trusted her blindly. What a fool. Now I understand those days were set aside for dates with her lovers after work hours. And the coming Thursday would be my special day of retribution. I was in bed reading when I heard Ellie come home. It was past midnight already. I turned off the light, put my book away, and pretended to be asleep. She quietly peeked into the bedroom then went into hers. A couple minutes later I heard the shower running. Ellie probably wanted to wash off the smell of sex after meeting with her lovers. That night I tossed and turned, staring at the ceiling, trying to figure out how to destroy all three of them simultaneously. It had to happen in one go so no one got wind of it and escaped. I imagined different revenge scenarios, but none matched the level of anger and hatred I felt inside. I only understood the final plan had to crystallize by next Thursday, the day my wife scheduled dates with her lovers. And then it hit me. I'd noticed the plot of the detective book I was reading before bed. An innocent man was framed for murder there. He got convicted based on fake evidence while the attorney and private eye desperately tried proving his innocence before the execution. That's it. I thought. That's just what I need. I put the book away, turned off the lights and immediately fell asleep for the first time in over a week. Now that I had a revenge plan involving a favorite plot line, frame up and fake evidence, I felt much calmer. All that remained was bringing it to life. In the morning, I told Ellie the doctor diagnosed me with the flu and prescribed medication to stay home once again. After she left for work, I got dressed and went out to conduct some additional investigation on her lovers. By the end of the day, I found out Oscar's wife worked as a paralegal secretary and missed the party because she traveled to her ill mother. Oliver's wife was a real estate agent who didn't come because she was trying to close a big money deal. Both marriages seemed stable, probably because the wives were unaware of the husband's adventures. I decided to remedy that very soon. On Monday evening, I followed Ellie to the same motel again. This time her lover's rendezvous was set up in a different room. Oscar greeted her at the door while Oliver pulled up five minutes later. Now I was certain my wife met with the men exactly on Mondays and Thursdays. My revenge plan was risky, even dangerous for me if I got caught, but I was willing to do it to repay the cheating wife and her friends. It cost quite a bit of money. Over the phone, I contacted the man I needed through mutual acquaintances. And at midnight, we met in an empty parking lot where I received the tool necessary for carrying out my vengeance. All I had left was waiting for the fateful hour of reckoning for Ellie and company. By the next Monday, I was fully prepared to carry out my revenge plan on the unfaithful Ellie and her lovers Oscar and Oliver. That evening, I followed her to the same motel. While all three were in the room, I got out of my car and went up to Oscar's vehicle. His car turned out unlocked, so I easily popped the trunk and stashed half a pound of marijuana behind the spare tire. Oliver's car was locked, so I had to use a special tool to get it open and plant the marijuana in his trunk as well. Then I locked it, attaching another bag of weed to the rear bumper to give the police probable cause for search. I drove half a block, called the police from a payphone, and reported Ellie, Oscar, and Oliver were conducting a drug deal in their motel room, providing their license plate numbers. They asked for my name, but I just hung up. Then I called the three local TV stations, giving them the same tip. I knew the new mayor was campaigning hard against psychotropics so the police would react quickly. The TV crews would want footage of a bust too. From a third payphone, I called Oscar's and Oliver's wives, telling them their husbands were spending time in a motel room with some woman. After that, I returned and parked nearby where I could watch events unfold incognito. It only took the police 10 minutes to arrive on scene after my anonymous call. But another half hour was spent preparing the operation. First two patrol cars pulled into the parking lot. They were followed by a SWAT van and two unmarked sedans with plainclothes detectives. 
By the time the police finished preparations, news reporters had already gathered at the site with their camera crews. The TV vans also took their positions for filming. I watched two SWAT members batter down the door with a ram. Four colleagues armed with automatic rifles stormed in after them, ready to catch the lovers off guard. The main spectacle was about to start, the show of my vengeance. Oh, how I wished I could see Ellie's reaction when that door suddenly burst inward. It only took three minutes for Ellie, Oliver, and Oscar to be led outside handcuffed. The men were in their underwear while Ellie was naked with just a blanket thrown over her shoulders. I activated the preset number on my cell phone and called Ellie's company president. When he picked up, I asked if he knew three of his managers were conducting illegal substance trade right out of the corporate office. Amidst his surprised questions, I switched to video call and began live streaming what was happening by the motel. While keeping anonymity and concealing my identity, I provided detailed data on Ellie's, Oliver's, and Oscar's personalities and secret meetups. After calling all five board members that way, I drove home. In searching Oscar's and Oliver's cars, the police discovered narcotics. Four more baggies were found in Ellie's purse and under the driver's seat of her car. Not knowing what Oscar's and Oliver's wives looked like, I couldn't confirm if they were present among the crowd but I sincerely hoped they were. The story aired prominently on the evening news on three channels. I couldn't help smiling when one anchor remarked that today the mayor had started fulfilling his election promises. The police busted a major drug cartel operating out of a local motel. No precise data on the confiscated amount yet. Viewers saw footage of the three perpetrators led away in cuffs and were urged to follow the updates on this ongoing event. After turning off the TV and setting my phone aside, I decided to go to bed. The moment Ellie reached out asking me to take out a loan on our house for bail made me laugh. She finally convinced her parents to provide the necessary amount. When released from jail and back home, she found all the locks had been changed. Then she discovered her belongings neatly packed in boxes lined up on the driveway. Why are you doing this to me? It's cruel. She protested, upset because you're a fallen woman and I want nothing more to do with you. I stated bluntly. But you don't understand if you've only let me explain. She started blubbering, but I cut her off. I got all the explanation I needed when I saw you naked let out of that motel room on the news. Get out of this house. I added, standing my ground. I firmly closed the door on Ellie. Afterwards, I helped her dad load up her stuff, although insisting not to discuss my situation with his daughter. Ellie kept calling two or three times a day, but I preferred avoiding any conversation. At one point, she even showed up at my office, but I had security escort her out of the building. Needless to say, after the scandal, Ellie, Oliver, and Oscar got fired from their company and soon faced legal troubles that proved to be far from easy. Despite it being a first offense amid the mayor's anti-drug stance, they didn't get probation as is often the case. Their situation was exacerbated by insisting on innocence, even after getting caught red-handed with banned substances. Ellie did herself serious harm by demanding a blood test, trying to prove she had no narcotics in her system. The test result clearly showed Ellie was clean. That allowed prosecutors to conclude that the psychotropics found in her purse and car were meant for selling, not personal use. Given the mayor's drive to demonstrate instant results in his war on drugs, the three were offered a plea deal, one year in prison and community service. With good behavior, they'd be eligible for early release. Their lawyer warned it was the best possible outcome, so they agreed to the terms. During Ellie's incarceration, I filed for divorce, same as Oscar's and Oliver's wives did. All three served their sentences, and when they got out, I continued keeping tabs on their fate. I knew after her incarceration, Ellie faced tremendous difficulties finding employment. Her resume tainted by scandal doesn't attract employers, and she's forced to revise her career plans. Former colleagues and friends avoid contact, she lost standing and trust professionally and personally. Oscar and Oliver go bankrupt after the divorce. They lose their homes and most possessions. Losing connection with their kids is a heavy blow, and they grapple with added emotional hardship trying to rebuild the ruined relationships. All three find themselves at the fringes of society, 
feeling the weight of condemnation from those near and dear. Everyday troubles combine with financial woes, and each step reminds them of the price to be paid for their actions. Upon learning of the betrayal, I felt I was being ripped out of reality, and instead of just ruining their lives, I began ruining my own. Each day of this ordeal, I felt the mixture of anger, resentment, and sense of treachery slowly corroding me from within. When I heard about the aftermath my revenge brought on to Ellie, Oscar, and Oliver, I felt the heavy burden on my conscience. Inside me, feelings of duty towards justice blended with pity for those whose lives I destroyed. This story made me hostage to my own desire for vengeance, turning me from pursuer into a man who himself became victim of blind fury. To this day, I keep asking myself the same question over and over. Was it worth it? That's the story. Share your thoughts in the comments about this situation and the behavior of the spouses. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and be sure to like this video. It will greatly help promote the channel. Take care and have a wonderful day.